stop. It's a pleasure to be here this evening to speak on this lectureship. As Michael said, I used to sit right over there for many years as I was a member of the congregation here at Sunny Slope. I would like to take time to talk about the speakers who are no longer with us that have gone on to their reward, but that's really not what my topic was. And so as we begin this evening, I want to talk about some things about the lectureship itself. I can recall when Brother Harold Wood had the opportunity to talk with Brother Elkins, Garland Elkins, about the lectureship and how to go about doing the lectureship and whether or not they thought that they could do it and how that lectureship began. And as we begin this chapter together, this talk together, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them to Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14. In this passage, as the writer says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. Now notice this, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Why? Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself a peculiar paper, people, zealous of good works. When we think about this passage, and we begin to think about the lectureship itself, you say, well, how, how do you tie that together? Well, you see the lectureships, the names of them, there on the walls, and I appreciate whoever got the ladder out and pinned those up there because I wanted to look at those, and I had Brother uh, Michael send me a, a list of all the titles. Uh, I think I've been to all but three of the lectures, and so I've heard most of the lectures, and I began to look at how the lectureships came, uh, were allotted out. Uh, there have been six lectureships, and this is the way I did it. You may look at it and say, well, I think I'd do it differently. Next year, you can come up here and do it differently if you want to. But six lectureships were on the home, 14 lectureships on Bible authority, 17 lectureships on Christian living, one on the Holy Spirit, one on hell, and one on prayer. Now in 1979, the first lecture was actually held at the North Marshall Church of Christ. And I remember attending that and uh, Brother Carl Ruiz was the preacher there at that time and they published a book and some of you probably still have that book. Uh, and the title of the book was uh, Needs of the Church. Now if you'll think about the needs of the church and look what's on the wall here. The needs of the church if you have listened to these lectures and applied them to your lives, these lectures, my, my topic is the spiritual value of 40 years of the West Kentucky lectures, those who have paid attention and applied these things to their lives, these lessons to their lives, have become better Christians because of this lectureship. And as we think about the lecture itself, you look at, the, we said there were six lectureships on the home. The church, our world needs strong homes. We need homes where we realize that mother and father come together and they stay together. They don't get a divorce every time someone blinks the wrong way. They stay together as God intended it to be. Homes are under attack in our world today. When God started the home, he planned one man and one woman for life. And that's the way it should be. The home is a, is a topic that has been covered again. Six lectureships covered that. As we looked at those lectureships, we saw we're taught how to be better husbands and better wives, how to be better parents. Well, that's going to help us to be stronger as Christians. And if we're stronger as Christians, that means we're more productive in the cause of Christ, but not only that, in the world itself. You know, if we could get the world to come to Christ, think about how beautiful that would be in our world today if the home had the place that it should have. Well, we know that the home is under attack, and as we look at the things today that are, are attacking the home, the works of the flesh made a mockery of God's intention. Now, people say, well, I, I, I'm tired of hearing about the home. Well, if we're tired of hearing about the home, why is it we're having trouble in our homes? Why is it we have fathers who are not staying home with their family and being there for them? Why is it we have wives who are not in subjection to their husband, not as slaves, but as wives standing with their husbands 
toe to toe as they walk the path to heaven. We look at the, the works of the flesh. Paul listed in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, beginning. He said, Now the works of the flesh are manifest are these adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, various emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you now, as I've told you before, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. There's the importance of having the lectureship, having lectures on the home itself, because souls are at stake. And that's what's really important. Each soul, the husband, the wife, there is a family that God wants to stay together. They've come, they've been united in, into marriage, in the bonds of matrimony before men and God. And as faithful Christians, look what they can do for the church. Most likely they'll bring children into this world. And those children then can be raised knowing that there is a God, knowing that there is a way that this family works. We put God first always, and that's the way it needs to be. Today in our country, homosexuality is, is being placed uh, on the forefront everywhere we turn. You, you turn on your television, you see commercials now with uh, man and, and man and woman and woman together kissing and doing things that, that they ought not be doing. Homosexuality is something that has no place in the world, but especially not in the church. You might say, well, it'll never affect the church. It'll affect the church if we don't pay attention to it. If we don't stay on top of things saying this is the way God wants the home to be, homosexuality is an abomination. Now understand this. We hate the sin, not the people. There are those who say, well, you know, if he's a homosexuality, just forget him. He's got a soul. And that soul needs to be reached. And so we try to study and convert those. Homosexuality, Romans chapter 1, verse 26 through 32 for this cause God gave them up into vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like, now notice this, they did not like to retain God in their, in their knowledge. Friends, today, those who are trying to push the homosexual agenda don't want anything to be said about God. That's why we need strong homes. That's why we need Christian husbands and mothers teaching their children. Go home tonight and ask your children, have you been heard anything at school? Did you hear anything among your friends about homosexuality? In recent months and, and, and days, I've been approached by those who are saying that the children are, are concerned about homosexuality in the school. Because they have friends who think they're homosexual. So there really shouldn't be anything wrong with it. That's why preachers, we need to preach on this subject to let our young ones know. And mothers and daddies, we need to sit and talk with our children about this topic. And let them know this is an abomination in the sight of God. The latter part of that verse, verse 32, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And so, friends, we need to have strong homes. We had several lectureships on the subject of the home. The church need Christ, needs Christian husbands and wives raising children to be Christians. We need to hear about the home. We need to hear the importance of mama and daddy sitting with a Bible in their hands teaching their children. But what happens? A man and woman come together, they get married, and, and it's expensive now to live, and so we have the mothers working, the fathers working, and then they, they, they bought something perhaps they shouldn't have bought, or maybe they're just spending more than they need to spend, so somebody gets another job. And sooner or later, they're not even together themselves. They're apart too much. That's not the way it needs to be. We need to be like Paul, whatever state I am, therewith be content. It's not wrong to have things, not saying that. But I'm saying if it takes you away from your spouse, you need to stop that. The home is important. Satan attacks today just like he did in the Garden of Eden. In uh, 1 John 2, 15, verse 17, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Lust is what happens. He said, For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. Notice, the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 
Friends, Satan knows how to attack us. If we don't talk about the home as this lectureship has, Satan will attack us, destroy our homes, destroy faithful members of the congregation. And so the lectureship, the spiritual value towards the home is great because we need more lessons on the home. And then the lectureship also covered Bible authority. The Bible is God's rule for mankind. There's nowhere else to go. How do I know whether or not I'm, I'm supposed to do this or that? I go to God's Word. God's Word tells us what to do, but that has to be the authority. You know, from time to time, we live in an area over at Richmond Hill outside of Savannah, Georgia, and we'll hear people come through who've been somewhere and they've got a good idea. And it sounds like a really good idea, but it's not scriptural. It's not something the church can be involved in. I'm proud that the congregation here, the elders, decided to have so many lessons on Bible authority. Notice the title of this lectureship, West Kentucky Bible Lectures. The Bible is God's authority. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Friends, if we understand the authority of God's Word, then we as Christians are going to be stronger. We need to spend more time studying that Word. The lectures that directed our attention to the authority of God's Word were there to help us and strengthen us so that we can be stronger Christians and go back to our congregations and show that strength there and help, help the members of the congregation, help the elders to see, help the preachers to see that God's Word has to be the authority. Not what I think or what you think, but what does the Word of God say? The book, the Bible, is what tells us how to be saved, tells us how to worship, tells us to worship God in spirit and in truth, and it's that book by which we'll be judged. Friends, God's Word is the authority. We look at salvation. In Romans chapter 6, uh, 1 through 8, Paul said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! He said, know you not that so many, uh, he said, how shall we, are dead in sin and live, uh, excuse me, how shall we live that are dead in sin and live no longer in? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? Notice, as Paul was writing here to these people, he's showing them the authority of God, the authority of, of what is to, be, is to be happening. He talks about salvation. He says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism to death, that even as like was Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see, he was talking about salvation. Paul was writing to these brethren whom he hadn't seen, talking to them about salvation. The authority of God is there for salvation. I'm studying with a man right now. He's been baptized twice in his life. He now believes he's a member of the uh, International Church of Christ. But he's willing to study, and we're studying. And as we th think about that, we're going to God's Word for the authority. We're going to that Word to show him what God says about salvation. And praying to God that he will obey the gospel before it's too late. Not only that, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to... Um, piercing even dividing asunder of, of the soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How strong is this authority? This authority has the, has the power to touch the hearts of mankind. It has the heart to, to pierce the, the sinful heart of man and to turn us to God. It has the strength to get a wayward child of God back to God. You know, I see people sometimes go to to uh, Christians who've wandered away and, and they begin to talk to them about this or that and kind of talk about the Bible a little bit. Talk to them about God's Word. Show them what God's Word says. Show the importance. Show the authority. You can't do what you want to do. You got to do what God says to do. God's Word is the authority that has to be followed. And so we had several lectureships on, on, Christian, on the Bible authority. But then the lectureships also call, covered Christian living. My favorite passage in the New Testament is Colossians chapter 3. I think if you want to know how to live the Christian life, read Colossians chapter 3. We're not going to have time to read the whole thing this, this afternoon. But go back just a little bit further. You think about what John wrote in the book of Revelation. Revelation 2.10, the latter part of that verse. Be thou faithful unto death. Why would we need lectureships? Why would we need lessons on Christian living? Oh, I'm a Christian? Yes. But are you a Christian 
like God wants you to be? How strong are you as a Christian? The spiritual value of the lectures on living a Christian life, if we take those to heart, if we, if we use those things that are given to us, how much stronger will we be? You know, these things have been recorded. I can recall when the brother sat here, the, he was blind, but he recorded the lectureships on tapes. Well, those st are still available. I know you have nothing to play those tapes on. But they make a little machine that will convert those to, to CDs. And before long, we're not going to have anything to play CDs. But it was put in form, media form, so we can still hear those lessons. We need to be studying those lessons. We think about Christian living. I want to read a little bit of Colossians chapter 3 for you. If you then be risen with Christ, notice, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Let's go back to the home for just a minute. And in some of those, it was kind of hard to decide, did I want to do home or Christian living? But the mamas and dads who get so caught up in this life forget about seeking those things which are above. They're, they're seeking the things here on the earth. And those things here on the earth are only for a little while. Oh, but I want my child to have the best of this and best of that. I want them to be on every team. Parents, children do not have to be on every team that comes along. They're kids. They love to play. I was on several teams when I was growing up. It was the Sandlot next door. We didn't, we called ourselves the Cardinals. Now I'm a Braves fan now, so just, just so you know. But we were the Cardinals. And we, Cincinnati, we didn't, but we didn't go and, and spend all the money. We, our parents didn't spend a lot of money on us, but you know, we still made it. We still grew up. You see, Christian living means that we seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things in the earth. Why? For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Is your life hid with Christ in God? Answer that question this evening. The lectureship gave us opportunities to hear about Christian living and things we need to do. And I recommend you read Colossians chapter 3 before you go to bed tonight. But not only is Christian living, living right before God and before man, but Christian living also means that as a child of God, I see my responsibility to let my light shine before men. Matthew chapter 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick that it giveth light to all that are in the house. Friends, let me ask you. Are you letting your light shine for God in your neighborhood? At your workplace? Are you letting your light shine before men as God wants us to? He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And here's the key. They may glorify your Father which is in heaven. Friends, that's what it's all about. I want to be a child of God. I want to be a faithful child of God. I want God to get to glory. This lectureship has told us this is the way we need to be living. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Notice this, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even in the world. And amen. So the lectureship has taught us about the home. It's taught us about Bible authority. It's taught us about Christian living. We think about Christian living. Let me, let me put a couple more passages here. Christian living includes keeping peace and harmony within the body of Christ and caring for others. I'm afraid that the church in many places has got to the point where caring for those on the outside is almost a thing of the past. We've got to care for those outside because they're not in Christ and they need to be in Christ. We need to be willing to take the gospel to them. We need to keep peace and harmony within the body. Lectureship taught us that. Those lessons that were presented were, were brought to show us that this is how you need to act as a Christian. And if we took those things personally, those lessons to heart, then we were stronger, better Christians, and we had better congregations because of it. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Paul said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you, notice that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Walking worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. The preachers who came and presented these lessons, they tried to get us to see the importance of realizing I'm a child of God. And as a child of God, there's a way I'm supposed to walk. There are things I'm supposed to do. There are things I can't do. Here's a way I've got to live my life. This is what God wants. They were trying to get us to see 
This is what we've got to dedicate ourselves to. Not dedicate ourselves to worldly things, but dedicate ourselves to God as we said we were going to on the day when we obeyed. Remember when you came up out of the water and you thought that you could save everybody in the world and you wanted to? You remember those days? What happened? The men who presented these lessons tried to get us to have that zeal brought back into our minds and hearts. And then Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. If there be any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship in the Spirit, any bowels of mercy, fulfill, my, fulfill you my joy. Notice this, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And then he brought us, brought the lesson to a, to a, a high point here. He said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Friends, we need to have the mind of Christ. We need to, to grow as a Christian. And so the lectureship brought us lessons about Christian living. And then the lectureship brought us lessons on, on the topics, Holy Spirit of hell and prayer. I missed last year. I was preaching a funeral and wasn't able to, to come to the lectureship. And I haven't been able to lesson, listen to the... Um, thank you. I'm from Georgia. I'm not supposed to be sweating this much. Thank you, Darren. Each of these subjects are subjects that we need to study as Christians. Most of us study things we like. Things that are easy. When's the last time you got a book out and studied the Holy Spirit? Well, you can't get a book out, but you can get the lectures on CD. And you can listen to those things. You can get them on DVDs. You can watch them. And learn more about the Holy Spirit. Brother Moser sitting there tonight. I remember being in his class when he taught the, the Holy Spirit. Now he told me, never quote him from my notes, so I'm not going to. But that week, the week, weekend we had the lessons on the Holy Spirit, the truth was taught. There are those in the world who teach false doctrine about the Holy Spirit. We've got to make sure we know how to defend the truth when it comes to those things. And then the, the lesson on hell. You know, there are a lot of people who believe in heaven, but no, nobody believes in hell. And then the lesson on prayer. I, I haven't been able to, to listen to the uh, DVDs yet. But I'm looking forward to that because prayer is one of the most personal things that a Christian can do in speaking to God. And we come from here with those prayers. I hope you're a prayerful person. I hope you're a prayerful Christian. I hope you pray for everything. You got a brother or sister you think's down? Pray for them. You got a problem? Pray about it. You got sickness? Pray about it. Take it to God. Do everything you can and let God have it. Sometimes we're too prideful to do that. Well, my topic was one that covered a lot of areas, and so I had to go through this rather quickly. I have more material, but uh, we don't have time to go through all of it. But I wanted to, to mention just a couple other things. When I, when I saw the, the title of the lesson a few weeks ago, The Spiritual Value of the West Kentucky Lectures, how do you put a value on that? I really don't think you can because if each individual, as I said in the beginning, listened and applied all these lessons to our lives, we're stronger today for it. It may be that some of these lectures have kept us from falling into temptation. It may be they've kept us from being led astray by false doctrine. It may be that they've brought us to a lost soul who needs the gospel. So how do you put, how do you put a value on that? My friends, God only knows the value of these lectures. I appreciate so much Brother Harold and Brother Bethel back when the lectureship started here at Sunny Slope and how they determined to go ahead with this and the other congregations that have helped. I personally want to thank you. Brother Nolte has helped for so many years. I want to thank you for being a part of this because this is something that has more spiritual value than we'll ever know in this lifetime. Thank you.